interesting meeting this week with the head of the STEP program, and we talked about things coming up. It was a wonderful time of sharing together, and then he did something that impressed me. He told me a joke that I had not heard before on a religious joke. And jokes often are a good way to point out our own human foibles and weaknesses in a way we can accept. And we can laugh at ourselves, and we don't get defensive about it. It's a wonderful thing. And here was the joke that he told me. There was a wealthy man, and he had strived all of his life to do well and to live as he ought as a Christian. And at the moment of his death, he prayed to God, God, I know this is against the rules, but could I bring one suitcase of some of my stuff with me? I really would like to do that. And God says, well, you know, now you've got me intrigued. I'm going to make an exception to the rule. One suitcase, bring it on him. And he died, and he shows up at the early gates with his suitcase. St. Peter looks at him and he says, this is very unusual. Would you mind if I looked in your suitcase and see what you brought with you? The man said, no, I don't mind at all. And so he opened the suitcase, and in it were gold bars, part of the man's wealth. And Peter looks up at him in great confusion and said, why did you bring the paving stones with you? I like that. Gentle way of reminding us of what's important and what is not. So, he is risen. He is risen indeed. This is a day for rejoicing. This is a day for joy. This is a day for laughter. And the New Testament is filled with joy and it pivots around this moment. This is also one of the stranger years for Easter. The last time that Easter fell on April 1st or April Fool's Day was in 1956. It will not happen again until 2029, 2040, and then it will not happen again in this century. So I'm taking advantage of this now. I may still be doing this in 2029, but I don't think so in 2040. So, I found out when I was doing research for Christian clowning back in college, yes, you've seen me do some clowning, and I actually did research on it, and the paper I wrote ended up in a journal, believe it or not, for evangelists. And clowning or foolery sometimes has a very serious side to it. It is a way to introduce people to some of their weaker sides, and things we could all improve on, and doing it with laughter. Laughter, witticisms, humors, and stories are all used to make these points, to stand against the high-bound traditions and customs of the day, the thing everybody knows is true and really is not, so this is serious business, offered with a very light touch. And Jesus was a master of this, all through history. You hear about the parables, well, that's not the stories. And he would tell jokes from time to time as well. And what he gave as tools were then later used by medieval court jesters, because the court jester was the only one, if he was well-educated and really good at his craft, who could stand up in court and tell the king that his plan was stupid and would not die for it. That was all because of Jesus. Jesus made that possible. Let's see what Jesus was up to on this extraordinary day. Getting to this morning, Jesus spent his ministry speaking against and acting against ridiculous customs and habits of his people. He taught people who were under a military occupation who were absolutely longing for a warrior messiah who would make Israel a power at the end of a sword and spear, that they shouldn't be seeking this. Instead, the way to the future was through peace, turning the other cheek, never striking back. The opposite of what they expected. In a materialistic age, Jesus told his followers to stop worrying about their possessions. A lot like the wealthy man in his bag of gold. In a day when men treated women as objects to possess, Jesus raised women up as equals. 
In an era that sneered at the poor and the outcast, Jesus sided with them and called them the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In an age when Israel's leaders applied all sorts of burdensome laws to the people that somehow didn't apply to them, Jesus said, come to me, my yoke is light. Jesus remained silent when he was brought before Pilate's kangaroo court. He did not give it the dignity of answer. He defeated the devil who was backing Judas. He forgave his killers as he was dying on the cross. And today, he showed that it was utterly ridiculous to believe the conventional wisdom that death has the final word. Which many outside the faith can find a stumbling block to them. This is serious business. It has lasting consequences for all of humanity, forever. The day begins in darkness. Before dawn, there's a figure moving slowly and cautiously toward the garden. Hunched over in grief, tear tracks on her cheeks reflecting moonlight. She is intent on honoring her beloved teacher, her healer, her friend, whom she is devoted to and spending some private time grieving in the garden. And she arrives at the tomb perhaps as dawn's first light touches the horizon and she stops in shock, sways. Her hands come to her face, her eyes get huge and she stares. The massive disc that several strong men had rolled in front of Jesus' tomb when he was buried has been rolled away. Removed from Jesus' tomb, and the tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene draws the only conclusion the average person is likely to draw. She does not remember what Jesus said. Instead, she thinks someone has stolen Jesus' body. But who? Was it the leaders who were so aggravated by Jesus' comments and his remarks and his jokes, like leaders take the log out of your eye before you try to take the speck out of someone else's? That was a joke right at the leadership. Did they do it? Was it Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus? Was it grave robbers? Who has done it? And now Mary Magdalene, distraught, throws custom to the wind. You see, no woman's testimony was trusted back in Jesus' day. And she ran for the disciples to do what she could. She found Peter and the disciple Jesus loved best, John. And she declares to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And this startling, shocking declaration and Mary's attitude was enough to get these two in motion. They needed to see for themselves, and they went running towards the tomb. And they had a race amongst themselves, John and Peter. And it was a race of what, what John, the disciple that Jesus loved best, was going to win beating out Peter. And this was a sly way in which the author could take a poke at another assumption of the day that those who were famous were better than everyone else. You see, Peter was far more famous than John, but John got to the tomb first, showing that even an average person can stand up, even amongst the famous. It's possible. A wit of an earlier age of the church, Eshad of Merv, declared that John's greater speed was due to him not being married. I don't know if that was an early version of Take My Wife, Please, but that's a joke that's come down through the ages. John, who had stayed with Jesus throughout his crucifixion, who Jesus had turned the care of his own mother over to as he was dying on the cross, John stops outside the tomb. He looks in, but he does not enter. At least not right away. And Peter comes up, puffing, a little out of breath. And he's always been the most impulsive amongst the disciples, and he just dives right on into the tomb. 
He takes it all in. He sees the empty tomb. He sees the grave wrappings lying to one side. The head cloth has been separately rolled up and neatly put down. Pretty much excludes the idea that it was grave robbers because grave robbers would have just taken everything with them. They didn't want to be caught. They would have been moving fast. They certainly wouldn't tidy things up. John, the other disciple, he comes in after Peter. He looks and sees. And he believes. But he doesn't believe what Jesus had told him. He believes Mary, that Jesus' body has been stolen. Peter says nothing. Together they turn and they go home. And they don't say anything to anyone. Skeptics would declare that this is all foolishness and say Jesus had only passed out on the cross and he revived in the pool of the tomb. But that, that is ridiculous. The body does not survive while well it's been placed on the cross. And a person who has been placed in the tomb back in the day had strips of cloth bound tightly around their arms and legs. Moving would have been very difficult. And even if you could move with the damage that he had incurred, there's no way he was going to get that rock away from the door from the inside where he could not even reach the edge of it. So somebody has taken his body is what the disciples believe. They turn their backs on the awful scene. They leave Mary weeping in the garden. And they head for home with the rising sun. For these disciples, <coughs> the sun has not yet risen, S-O-N, as far as they know. The joy of Easter is still a ways off for them. John was faithful at the crucifixion, and Mary is faithful at the tomb. She wants to get to the bottom of this ministry. She is fixated on getting Jesus' body back putting it in its rightful place with all the respect that he deserves. She's alone again. And you know when you hope you've been wrong, you check something again because maybe I got it all wrong. It's a desperate hope. Well, that Mary, I think that's what she was going through because she looks back into the tomb, takes another look in there. And her eyes are blurred with the tears. But she blinks them away because she doesn't see what Peter and John saw. They looked in and they saw grave rabbits lying about. She looks in and instead of seeing the white burial cloth, she sees two figures dressed in dazzling white. One sitting at the head of the ledge or one at the foot where Jesus had been laid. And they look up at her and she looks at them, and they are messengers from the Most High God, sitting there casually. And the angels ask her why she cries. This question must have seemed absurd, and the answer obvious to Mary, who says, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where to find him. And in that moment, she has nothing more to do with those two. She turns her back on them. She's got no patience for their questions. She doesn't know why the disciples didn't mention them if they had seen them. She dismisses that and returns to her single-minded objective to find Jesus' body. And she turns right around to Jesus himself. But for Mary and for us, we can become so convinced by worldly wisdom and worldly customs and ways of understanding things that we don't see what's right in front of our face, particularly if it seems impossible or unnatural, like a victory over the grave, a victory over death. And so Mary sees someone in front of her. But worldly wisdom tells her it can't be Jesus, and so for Mary she sees a gardener. Now this is interesting because... It was a lowly and unacceptable group of people who first heard about Jesus' birth and came to see him. Shepherds in the field. They were considered very lowly because they couldn't get into town, they couldn't get washed up and go to church. And so they were very low. And they were the first people to see Jesus. And now Mary has assumed that Jesus, resurrected from the dead, is a lowly gardener, another person of low position. And so, then this person asks her, 
again. Why are you weeping? And who are you looking for? You can imagine her rising anger at this repeated question. And so without explanation, Mary declares, perhaps with gritted teeth, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And in that moment, she was probably aggravated enough to hoist the limp body herself and drag it off. But Jesus, like the most excellent jester, Refuting a wayward ruler's bad idea shatters Mary's assumptions, Mary's view of life and death, Mary's belief that the violence, torture, and death on the cross was the last word of an unbeatable empire against Jesus' ministry. And he shatters it with a single word, lovingly spoken. All he says is, Mary. I only have one intimation in my life, and I thank God that I only have one, of what Mary must have gone through in that moment. It happened in my first year of ministry here, I believe. Our dog, Daisy, had eaten 10 inches of ribbon. And it got bound up in her guts, and she could not eat, and she was going to die. Well, Cherry took her to an emergency vet. And they said, oh, we could, we could fix it, but it will cost you $10,000. And I said, I'm sorry. Tell them that she must be put down. We can't do that. For three hours, I believed that Daisy was dead. And you know how we feel about our pets that are like part of the family. And so I sat there in my office and tried to compose a sermon with the realization or the belief that I had just had our dog put down. Then I received the phone. Sherry had found another vet out in the who could do it for a price that we could afford. Our dog was alive and well. I believed her dead for three hours. That stripped my gears a little bit. It's the only thing that gives me an intimation of how, how Mary must have felt when she heard her name and realized who spoke it to her. And now this is the true dawning of the new day for Mary and for humanity. Mary is with Jesus in the garden. And this is the second Adam, as Adam was intended to be. The first Adam had not done well and had brought mortality to humanity. The second Adam had done as God desired and brought us eternal life. And the world changed forever. And Mary responded herself with one word as well. Rabboni! And in the Bible, it just says parenthetically that that means teacher. Well, I imagine Mary has thrown her arms around him as she screams it, because that is teacher in its most familiar form, which is best translated as my beloved teacher. Something said with joy and with tears and with delight. And Jesus... There, risen on Easter morning, resurrected by the power of God, in his first moments, once again stands against human tradition and human values, the values of his people, and he tells Mary, don't hold on to me, because you have work to do. The world of Jesus' day did not trust a woman's testimony. Jesus trusts it implicitly. Jesus makes Mary Magdalene the first evangelist of Easter morning. And now, all through history, it is Mary Magdalene who declares to all the disciples of every age, I have seen the Lord. 
When the world confuses us, when the world has us turned around, when we're looking for Jesus in all the wrong places, know that Jesus will walk up to you and say your name and shatter your preconceptions and change your way of seeing the world. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, let's try that with enthusiasm. It's Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent reflection.